Good morning. Welcome to First Congregational Church. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. First, some announcements. Number one, Broome County moved into a high-risk zone for COVID spread per CDC guidelines. Jason Garner gave a press conference regarding this status. He is recommending that all churches, schools, businesses, etc., require mask use for everyone, regardless of vaccination status. Per the press conference, 20% of new cases in Broome County are breakthrough cases, meaning that they are individuals who have had the COVID vaccine. It is still a first congregational guidance to use masks when entering, walking around in, and leaving the building. Please limit physical contact and do not congregate in the building after service due to the increasing spread of COVID. Number two, due to the Delta variant in our area, as if we don't have enough problems, right? <laughs> the decision has been made to cancel this year's ice cream social. Today is the last day to donate to the school supply drive. Supply kits will still be given to the students in need of them. In 2019, we gave out over 200 school kits. We would like to provide the same level of support to these families, especially given COVID circumstances. Financial contributions can be made to the church office or with your Sunday uh, offering. Number three. Rally Day will be Sunday, September 19th. Come and enjoy the first comeback of Joyful Noise since the pandemic began one and a half years ago. As in the past, we will take our picture together outside by the bell. Come out and enjoy this special service and please remember to wear red. Now for the peace. May the peace of God be with you. Please now wave to each other in peace. Please join me in reading the statement of oneness. We were made in the image of God, thus as we grow in faith and mature in spirit, that image shall shine all the more clearly. Like Jesus, we are children of God, thus is our birthright, we shall live all our days surrounded by unconditional love. Humanity 
the image of God, is beautiful in God's sight, part of a magnificent creation. Therefore, we are beautiful in God's eyes. The scriptures declare that the entire kingdom of God is within us. Also, we live our lives immersed in divinity. We gather to celebrate that sacred and wondrous truth. Many hurtful and unjust things happen in our world, motivated by hatred or fear. Yet also, there is love in our hearts. Let us declare that love, acknowledge it is of God, and promise to grow in love day by day. Amen. Now let us read uh, our responsive call to worship. You call your people to prayer and praise in many ways. This day, bring us together just as you called the people of Israel to gather manna in the desert to eat and sustain life. God of unity, give us this day our daily bread. Offer us the nutrients we need to strengthen our connection to you. As spiritual beings, we desire to re receive food that endures, faith, hope, and love. God of grace, give us this day our daily bread. All life is created and nourished by you. May we grow into new circles of understanding and being reflecting the ways in which we have been touched by your holy manna. Holy Spirit, come, give us this day our daily bread. Our first hymn today is Praise to the Living God, number 18.
Now please join me in the unison prayer. In the beginning, you beamed light that shines in the darkest hour, light that no darkness could overcome. Pierce the soul of this nation with your light and enlighten everyone with your divine wisdom. Pierce the soul of this nation with your light and blind the demons of violence and hate. Pierce the soul of this nation with your light that our chests draw in hope and our hands grasp with strength and our innards gird with all their might and our hearts pump the life blood of an unlikely luminous new beginning being born. Amen. Our first scripture reading today is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of death, I, feel no, I fear no evil. For you art with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies and anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And our second reading from Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, a rather famous passage in the third chapter. Of this gospel, I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of his power. Although I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the wisdom of God and its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose that he has carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have access to God in boldness and confidence through faith in him. I pray, therefore, that you may not lose heart over my sufferings. For you, they are your glory. The word of God. God. I'd like to say first that it's a bit difficult after preaching for decades to just stop. So thank you for inviting me back. Um, a quote from the mid winter of 1947 from a writer who left the hustle and bustle of New York City to vacation in the peace and the calm of Acapulco. Clearly she had had enough. However, it should be noted that after the vacation, she returned to the city. And here's the quote. <clears throat> to me, Acapulco is the detoxicating cure for all the evils of the city. Ambition, vanity, quest for success in money, the continuous, contagious presence of, of the power-driven, obsessed individuals who want to become known, to be in the limelight, noticed, 
as if life among millions gave you a desperate illness, a need of rising above the crowd, being noticed, existing individually, singled out from the mass of ants and sheep. Here, in Acapulco, all this is nonsense. You exist by your smile and your presence. You exist for your joys and your relaxations. You exist in nature. You are part of the glittering sea and part of the luscious, well-nourished plants. You are wedded to the sun. You are immersed in timelessness. Only the present counts. And from the present, you extract all the essences which can nourish the senses. And so the nerves are still. The mind is quiet. The nights are lullabies. The days are like gentle ovens in which infinitely wise sculptors' hands reform the lost contours, the lost sensations of the body. As you swim, you are washed of all the excrescences of so-called civilization, which includes the incapacity to be happy no matter what. That's from the French Cuban writer Anais Nin from her diary. So now, two intriguing vocabulary words from that quote. The first one, detoxicating. Pretty much the opposite of intoxicating, a concept we've all known since college. <clears throat> Word is found mostly today not in reference to the evils of the city or even in references to alcohol, but rather refers to diets intended to remove toxin from our bodies. I went on a detox diet for the last three days, someone might say. And then a new vocabulary word, excrescences. And yes, the same root as excrement. So please pardon me if the sermon gets a bit earthy. But the word applies to those bits that cling to us. She writes, as you swim, you're washed of all the excrescences of so-called civilization. All those foul little bits get washed away. Seriously, I can't think of two better words to describe about how I have felt about American culture over the last four years or so. The bitterness of the political divide, the deadly misinformation in social media, the January 6th insurrection. I can't tell whether it's toxic or excrement or both. Now, the context of the thoughts that I wish to share with you this morning come from a book that I read earlier this summer. Jesus and John Wayne. <clears throat> and then the subtitle, which you can't read from your distance, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation. It's by Christian Kobes Dumez professor of history at Calvin College in Michigan. Now, despite the title, it's a rather academic book articulating the history of the political influence of white evangelicals from the Cold War up to and including the most recent Republican administration. She attempts to explain, toward the end of the book, why white evangelicals supported our previous president, both during the 2016 and 2020 uh, elections, to the tune of about 80%. It's sort of a difficult question to figure out. On the face of it, it's a real head-scratcher. So you know how the Catholic Church has the list of the seven deadly sins? They also have a list of the seven cardinal virtues. And the understanding is that these seven, from these seven, derive 
all virtues. From these seven spring all righteous and godly living. Here's one of the original versions. Chastity. Temperance. Charity. Diligence. Patience. Kindness. And humility. The more modern version. Prudence. Justice. Temperance. Courage. Faith. Hope. And charity. By virtually every moral standard embraced by Christianity, our previous president was the opposite. Yet his support from white evangelicals never wavered until very recently. And what Dumez shows with her heavily documented and footnoted history is that their support was not an exception. It was not an anomaly but part of their consistent history. In other words, their moral compass has not wavered since the Cold War. It's difficult to overstate the degree to which reading that history has affected me, made me awash with feelings of shame. Because I was raised evangelical, and obviously I'm white. And for longer than I care to admit, I was a willing part of that travesty of the Christian faith. In my naivete and sometimes willful blindness, I was complicit in that insidious corruption of the faith I love so dearly. During college, this would be in the late 70s and the early 80s, I was part of Campus Crusade for Christ an evangelical campus ministry, discussed and analyzed at length in the book. Our fearless leader was Bill Bright, who passed away in 2003. His goal back then was to evangelize the world by the year 2000. And if we succeeded we would usher in the 1,000-year reign of Christ foretold in the book of Revelation. He also was one of the authors of what's called the Land Letter, which outlined a just war rationale for the 2003 invasion of Iraq, providing a theological underpinning for the invasion being planned by then-President George W. Bush. Now, sidebar for a moment. Back prior to that 2003 invasion, nearly all the major Christian denominations, over 95 of them, including Presbyterians, the UCC, Methodists, Lutherans, Episcopalians, etc., etc., and also including the Roman Catholic Church, wrote to President Bush, imploring him not to invade Iraq preemptively. The land letter came from the Christian right, offering this rationale to invade using some semblance of just war theory, which, by the way, was invented by the Catholics. So for us worker bees in the Campus Crusade for Christ, The pressure was on for us to evangelize the whole world. We created evangelical rallies and crusades and revivals. And the part which was distasteful for me, but I did it anyway, was cold calling. Choosing a name from the phone book, calling them up, and trying to convert them to Christ over the phone. And although I kept it secret at the time, I can now admit that I never converted anyone. Jesus' return would just have to wait. 
Despite Bill Bright's goal, today, 32% of the world's population is Christian. 32%. A century ago, it was 35. From college then, as I entered into full adulthood, I began to study other religions and became fascinated with interfaith dialogue. And I became disillusioned with Campus Crusade for Christ and evangelicalism generally. I had two issues. First, the notion of converting the world by the year 2000 had a silliness to it. Can you imagine converting Zen Buddhists? To be blunt about it, their spiritual lives, by all appearances, seemed so much grander and deeper and happier than that of the Christians I knew. Can you imagine converting en masse Tibetan monks or Sunni Muslims or the Jews? Yeah, right. Within a generation of the Holocaust and the establishment of the state of of Israel, we're going to convert all the Jews? Silliness. My second issue was arrogance. I was told over and over again that we had the one true religion. And as much as I liked Christianity and intended to remain Christian... The day arrived when I simply didn't believe that anymore, that we were the only ones with the full truth of God. The notion of human beings claiming perfect knowledge about an infinite deity? Well, that seemed both arrogant and silly. Actually, I did have a third issue. They were all anti-evolution creationists which from a scientifically literate point of view is inexcusable. My days of being part of the evangelical right were coming to an end. And so now, decades later, after the white evangelicals have corrupted a faith and fractured a nation, I can now ask, what about First Congregational Church? What about us? Where do we fit into this history? In my opinion, we are a people of faith attempting to live deeply moral lives, attempting to understand a God who is both imminent and inscrutable, attempting to be part of a church that values the questions as much as the answers, and attempting to value truth, truth with a capital T, whether it's articulated by a black person or a gay person or a woman or a black gay woman scientist. So what are we to do, all 30 of us, little Davids in the midst of this Goliath, The honest answer is that there's not much we can do about the grand scheme of things. But the grand scheme of things has been and still is in God's hands. Our task, I suggest to you this morning, goes back to those vocabulary words. Our task in our present and much smaller context involves us being the removers of toxins, and the cleansers of excrement that we find in our daily lives. Toxins and excrement are found on TV, on Facebook, in our politics, and in our COVID discussions. Our job essentially is to be the adult in the room for our nation. Our task is to have the mental and spiritual clarity to be a remover of toxin and a cleanser of excrement. We are to be the ones to bring those cardinal virtues into situations where they're sorely lacking. Chastity, 
temperance, charity, diligence, patience, kindness, humility. I'd like to conclude with two sayings from the Bible that on the face of it seem outlandish, but yet still somehow, some way might be true. When the Apostle Paul was complaining to God about that mysterious thorn in the flesh that he had, the Lord replied three times to him, saying, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And then the other one is from the passage in the bulletin. That through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known. That through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known. That through this church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety, might now be made known. That's the task of the church, which means that it's our task, you and me, here and now. Remove toxins, cleanse excrement, spread wisdom, strengthened by the grace and the power of God. Amen. For our prayers this morning. Oh, sure, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. now for our prayers uh, this morning. Um, uh, first of all, the 21-year-old son of Harris and Deborah Thor uh, was killed tragically in a motorcycle accident this last Wednesday. And so to prayers for that family um, completely. Uh, also, I have been told that Sister Lois Barton of the Sisters of St. Joseph in Windsor um, passed away also this last week in a swimming accident in Cape Cod. 
And so she was the head and director of the Sophia Center upstairs. And so prayers for them as well. And then prayers generally for Afghanistan, for the refugees, for all those assisting in the extraction efforts worldwide. And then also prayers for Louisiana as they brace not only for uh, an escalation of COVID um, in their hospitals, but also for the hurricane bearing down upon them. Any others at this time to mention? Yes. Thank you. Yes, Doug. Thank you. Marty? Was it Tom, did you say? Any others? Yes. Thank you. Yes. I'm from a college student um, that I've spoken to for a young lady, um, hoping that this is a safe year and a, a happy year for them. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes. Amen. Thank you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come before you as part of your church, an assembly where we know that you are present with us through your spirit, your spirit communing with ours. And we give you thanks for that honor and that gift of always being able to communicate and commune with you. We pray this morning for some huge concerns that weigh upon us. Our country has been involved in a war that we have decided to give up on. And now that there are hundreds of thousands of people who are now in danger and may lose their lives because of our withdrawal. And so we pray for that situation. We pray for the governments involved and the decision makers. Through your spirit, guide them. We pray for those working with the extraction efforts and those contributing dollars toward that. Through your spirit, guide them and hold them in the palm of your hand. And all of those Afghanis left in danger. We pray for them as well. Hold them close. Keep them safe. We pray. For the people of Louisiana. For those resisting efforts to ameliorate this disease. We pray. For those hospital workers, the doctors and the nurses and all others, we pray. For those entering the hospital, we pray. For those who will deal with the cleanup after the hurricane, we pray. We pray for our friend and beloved beloved friend, Sister Lois, and as well for Tristan, 
who died recently. Welcome their souls into the light and peace of your presence. We pray as well for the other sisters of St. Joseph and for the Sophia Center as they mourn Lois' loss. We pray for John in the hospital and for Aaron entering hospice. We pray for Tom, seriously ill. We pray for college students, actually all students, as they enter a new school year with so many unknowns, mask or no mask, vaccine or no vaccine, what do we do, home, Zoom, be present, what to do. Hold them all close. Guide them through your spirit. May this be a good academic year for them. And finally, Lord, we pray for those who are attempting to solve our climate issue. Both COVID and climate are worldwide issues. And so there's a gift in this because our species has never had to solve problems on a global scale like this. Through your spirit, teach us to get along so that we can find solutions that affect everyone and help everyone. Unstop our ears when you are talking to us. Remove the stubbornness when, we're, when you are guiding us. You are our Lord. Thank you for all of your gifts that you shower upon us. May we always be grateful. And hear us now as we pray using the words you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him who sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Mm-hmm.